Today I want to speak to you about each one. Each one. I read a story about these five missionaries. There they are. They were sent to a mission field in Ecuador, the jungles of Ecuador. Their main focus was to reach a tribe called the Hawarani tribe. So while they were there, John Elliot, the one in the middle, started to learn the customs and the cultures and traditions, even the language of the people. They were a tribe that has never been seen by white people before, especially by missionaries. Never heard the gospel of Jesus before. It was very difficult to locate them because they were in the jungles. So Nate Saint, one of your second right there, Nate Saint was a missionary pilot and he had this cool little yellow airplane. And what they used to do, they used to fly around the jungle and actually try to locate him. And when he found him, he used to drop down food and gifts, finally get a bit of friendship, a bit of rapport going with the guys. And eventually he found this dry strip of, like a, a seabed, next to the river Kararai. So he decided this is perfect. Your land is playing there, and then you can actually reach the people quick and they can come and see him and they can come talk to him. So finally, he took the five guys out there, landed on the riverbed, and there they were waiting for this great moment. They were anticipating great things, very excited. First time ever, they were going to preach the gospel of Jesus to this tribe, the Havarani tribe. But before that day was over, all five men were killed. Killed by the spears of that Havarani tribe. All they wanted to do was preach the gospel. All they wanted to do was reach one person with the gospel of Jesus. And they ended up paying the ultimate price, giving their own life, that somebody else may hear the gospel. They were true ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we have one simple message, to bring people to Jesus. This is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians. It says, we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal to us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That is the message of the church. There is no other message. Be reconciled to God. You see, when we are born into sin, we are all alienated from God. We are enmity with God. We don't know the things of God. But through Jesus Christ, He has reconciled us. We now become partners with God in Him. Our one message, forget about all the other stuff the church talks about, the, the baptisms and tongues and yearnings and memberships, forget all about that. This is our message. Be reconciled to God. Each of us are called as an ambassador and an ambassador for Christ to reach out to just one person. Do you know how many Christians there are in this world? Anybody want to guess? There's two billion. It's quite a lot. Two billion Christians. So imagine if there's two billion active practicing Christians and each one of them reached out to one other person. In no time, how many would there be? Four billion Christians on this earth. Do you know how many total people on this earth? Seven and a half billion. So just by each one of us reaching out to one other person, we can half the population of Christians on this earth. Yet why is the earth and the world in such a state? Because of you and I. Because we are the ones who are leaving a lost part of the world and we are not reaching out to them with a simple gospel, with the message of Jesus Christ. And I know it's not always easy. Some people find it difficult to witness. Who finds it difficult to witness? We can be honest. And he told us, well, that's all of us are good evangelists so far. And see, all the God can have Those who put up here an excuse, you can leave now. <laughs> sometimes difficult. And that, that's a problem, you see, because we get so overwhelmed by the idea of witnessing to people because our faith is personal. It's a personal relationship that we have with Jesus. So when it comes to witnessing to people, immediately we shy away. We don't know the tools, how to do this. There was one great uh, evangelist, his name was. C.S. Lewis, anybody know this man? C.S. Lewis, a great preacher, a great Christian author. He was actually friends with J.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings. Yeah, big fan of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Clive Staples Lewis said this, Christianity is false. It's of no importance. And it's true of infinite importance. The only thing, it cannot be more than It's a very good statement. He says, you know, Christianity is false. Don't no worry about it. They always just leave here and never come back. It's all finished. But if it is true, that is of eternal consequences. Because the people out there are going to where? To heaven, to paradise, or I know they're going to hell. The people that don't know Jesus are on their way to hell right now, this moment, will be in this church. And if Christianity is important, then forget about it. If it's true, then it's your responsibility to reach out to these people. He said something else. You know what else he said? He said the church exists for one purpose and one reason only. The church exists for one purpose only to draw people. Christ. Let me say that again. The church exists for no other reason 
than to draw people to Christ. He said, if we are not doing that, then all the cathedrals, all the churches, all the clergy, all the ministers, all the missions, all the sermons, is simply a waste of time. It is for you and I. My job, personally as a pastor, is to draw you closer to Jesus. It's your job as a Christian to draw the lost people closer to Christ. That is our goal in life. I heard this joke about this barber who wanted to witness to people. So he said to God, God, the first person who walks in my shop today, I'm going to witness to you. So they're all excited. There the first man walks into the barber shop. And he says, good morning, I'd like to shave. He says, okay, just take a seat. I'll be back now. The barber goes to the back shop, the back room, and he prays to God and says, God, yes, my wife, yes, God, it's coming. I'm going to witness to you. Please give me the right words to say to this man. So he comes out of the room. He starts walking towards the man in the chair. In the one hand, he's got a razor knife. And the other hand, a Bible. And he says, good morning. Are you ready to die? He didn't laugh at that. I thought it was a big joke. Here we go. Some people got it. Yeah. He thought he was witnessing, but he didn't do a good job of it. In the Bible, there was a man that understood how we can each just reach one person with the gospel of Jesus. Let's read that together. They have the Bibles. They stir the book of Acts. Who's got the Bibles with you? I like to do a tell you. Who's got Bibles? Put up your hand. Who's got a Bible? No? Okay. So check it. Next time, I'll watch you again. <laughs> it's good to have the Bibles with you guys. Just uh, Next time, I think I'm going to put the screen off. And fourth one, you can read. All right. Acts, chapter 8. I'm going to read about this wonderful evangelist called Philip who understood this beautiful principle of each one reaching one. Thank you, David. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of gardens, queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was just sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot, and stay in the end. Thank you. It's not busy. Philip, was he an apostle? Yeah, anybody want to say yes or no? He was a deacon. He was an apostle. <laughs> so what happened was the 12 apostles, they were preaching the gospel of Jesus and they were preaching the kingdom to the Jews. That was the primary focus. And then eventually they started to help the community also. They started to help orphans and the widows and pay money for them to help them. And they came to the for them. So it's was too big a responsibility for the apostles. So they decided, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to appoint seven deacons. And then they're going to deal with all that work, all the community charity outreach work and we're going to focus on preaching the gospel. And that's where Philip comes up. One of these seven men was a man called Philip. Philip was a great evangelist, a great preacher. In a one story in the same chapter, we find him in a town in Samaria and he's preaching up the storm. Lots of people have been saved. He's, got, he's been delegated with authority and the power of the apostles so he can heal people. He's got no demons. He's just doing an awesome job. And then God calls him away from all the crowds, away from the town, and says to him, Listen, I want you to go to preach to just one person. So, can you believe this? He says, Come. So an angel comes to him and says, go follow the desert road from Jerusalem down to Gaza. So he does this. He obeys God and he starts to leave in the town of Samaria. And he goes all the way down to Jerusalem, all the way down to Gaza. And at that time, the Holy Spirit comes to him. And the Holy Spirit tells him, follow that chariot. You see that chariot there, Philip? Follow after. That's all he does. But it's very important. It's interesting to notice that first the Holy Spirit speaks to him. And that he obeys the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. When last has the Holy Spirit speak, spoken to you? When last has the Holy Spirit spoken to you? You know the truth. It was probably two minutes ago. It's probably five minutes ago, ten minutes ago. At best, twenty minutes ago. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you all the time. The question is not, is He speaking to you? The question is, are you listening to Him? That's the problem with Christians. There's so much noise and confusion and chaos in our lives. We've got so much on our plate that when God speaks to us, we can't hear Him. It's like we've got a hearing problem. Heard about this elderly couple. The elderly man turns to his elderly wife and says, Honey, I'm so proud of you. She's hard of hearing. She turns to him and says, Yeah, well, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that happened here before. So <laughs> it reminds me of Christian because sometimes we are hearing God. And he doesn't have to shout. We want God to shout at the top of his lungs and tell us what to do. 
It's not God that needs to shout. We need to get rid of all the clutter. Get rid of all the noise and all the rubbish in our lives. And then if we just listen, we will hear God speaking so softly and so beautifully. It's a beautiful story of Elijah in the Bible. I mentioned one of my messages. The, the one chapter, Elijah was calling fire down from heaven. And, oh, man, amazing stuff was happening. The next chapter we see him in the cave, depressed, wanting to die. And at this point, he wants to hear the voice of God. And all of a sudden, there was a great earthquake outside, a great fire. And he looked, and God was not in the fire. Then there was a great storm and a great wind rose up and he looked for God and God was not in the wind. Then after the wind died and after the fire died up, he could hear the soft, still voice of God. The question today is not whether God is talking to you because believe me, he is. The question is, are you listening? Just like Philip, the Holy Spirit spoke to him. He heard it. Why? Because he wasn't talking about this stuff. He had one focus, one goal, and that was be reconciled to God. Wherever he went, his focus was Jesus. He didn't care about Donald Trump and Zuma. He didn't care about the weather and the drought. His focus was Jesus. So when the Spirit spoke to him, he immediately heard it. And he followed after it. And then he went towards the chariot. And in the chariot was an African man, an Ethiopian. An Ethiopian government official that was from Jerusalem. And he was returning back home to Jerusalem. Up to Jerusalem, back to Ethiopia. And in his hand, he got the book of Isaiah. And he was busy reading through this book of Isaiah. It was a scroll, actually. He was reading the scroll of Isaiah. And then Philip was next to him. Philip wasn't doing anything at this point. He didn't jump in and start Bible punching him. He just walked next to the chariot. And he overheard this man reading from the scrolls of Isaiah. And that's when the key came in. All of a sudden, Philip understood what he was there for. At this point, he had no idea. Remember, the angel said, go walk. And there's a road he done it. The Holy Spirit said, go to the chariot. He went to it. Not knowing what the plan was. But at this one moment, he heard this man speaking from the scriptures. And the penny dropped. And you know what it was? He thought, ah, oh, God, this is all been set up. This is why I'm here. Because there's someone who needs to hear about Jesus. Let me tell you that each one of us has had this divine appointments in our life. And I know you can remember that the times when you've come to somebody and all of a sudden they weren't Christians. They didn't know all about Jesus in the Bible. But yet they got onto a spiritual topic. They started to talk about God and Christianity. And you were there. Do you remember times like that in your life? How many of you said nothing and ran away? Maybe I did a couple of times. <laughs> because all of a sudden you think, whoa, what's going on? I don't know what to say to this person. He's talking, asking me about Jesus. And what do we do? Jip and keep quiet. You know what's going to happen this week? God is going to send those people to you by the hundreds. <laughs> just because you heard this message. Before you might have been oblivious to it. You might have thought it was just coincidence. But it's not. God has set that up. He has sent people up in your life, whether it be the dentist, the waiting room, the doctor's waiting room, people have to work. And it happens to me all the time. And all of a sudden, you don't realize this person never talks about God and Jesus. But all of a sudden, out of the bruise, this person starts talking about Jesus and asking you questions. And now, from now on, you're going to start recognizing what that is. What is that? And a divine appointment. And let that happen today. And when that happens, I know you're going to say, no, but it's going to happen. Get on his, I've got his number here. He don't phone me. I thought it was going to happen, all right? <laughs> and when that happens, please be susceptible to it. When you hear someone asking you something about Jesus and wants to know about God, don't run like you did before. Stay there like Philip. Philip heard it, and he heard this man, and then he, the, the man looked at Philip, this Ethiopian, and he said, You know, I'm reading this, it's called desire. And then Philip said, Do you understand it? Do you know what it's about? And the man said, No, how do I understand this unless somebody tells me about it? Ah, and then Philip took the bait, and he shared the gospel of Jesus with you. Now I'm going to teach you some practical advice on how to do this. There's no use me telling you to run out there and evangelize the world without giving you the practical tools on how to do it. There's many books you can get, many wonderful books on how to evangelize and how to witness to people. There's many different acronyms. This is the one that I use. It's a very simple one, and it's called FIRE. Remember the song, Soul on Fire? Not soul. You want to sing it? No? no? Just me. <laughs> FIRE. Okay, it's an acronym that stands for this. Family interest, religion, and school. So when you are witnessing to someone, especially those that don't know God, don't know Jesus, don't have a relationship with Him, this is how you start. Start by asking questions. You first ask by starting questions about his family. Everyone loves to talk about the family. I've got 10 people in my family. I can talk for hours in the days. All right, everyone likes talking about the family. So you ask him simple questions about their husband, wife, children, mother, father. Where are they? Where they live? Simple things. So you start building up a rapport, with a foundation. 
It's personal, so you show personal interest, and also it's very, very, you know, out there, so no, no, nothing deep in. The next thing is interest. Ask the person about the interest in your hobbies. What do you do? I play guitar, I can watch movies. What movies do you like to watch? Action, action. Well, that's me, sorry. <laughs> you chicks like your chick flicks, right? So you ask about interest in hobbies. What do you like? I like to do, I like to paint. So then you take another interest in his life, and then you move it from his personal life over to his religious, spiritual life. That's where religion comes in. Now, you know in this church, religion is like a swear word. Because religion is all the institutional churches out there, right? The, the, the four walls. And everything that governs these four walls. That is religion. So when you talk about religion to a person, you're not talking about his salvation to the church. You're talking about his religious background. Listen, what church have you come from? Are you in a church? If you're like me, you were... Raised a Catholic, then you joined a Methodist church, you were saved in the Baptist, went with full gospel, and then you ended in a congregational church. And you gave a picture of that church. That, that's my life. So you might hear that from somebody. Now, you know, was, most people were born Catholic. I don't know why. Maybe the old age. Born Catholic. And then, you know, then they'll say, no, I joined a Methodist church for a while. Uh, I'll be in the Pentecostal movement for a couple of years. But in the last 10 years, I haven't been to church. In anything, you, you just understand where this guy's spiritual background is. Is he a Christian? Is he not a Christian? Does he go to church? Does he understand anything about God? So when you talk about religion, you just, and it's not deep questions, just what church we in? What church we in? Simple. And he'll tell you, with that you can gauge on his Christian life, as it been through the years. The last one's the most important. You explore. So from his religious background, his physical background, what church, you dig one step deeper, and that's into the personal salvation of the person. Because that's what he's there to do. He's there to bring Jesus to this person so he can be saved. That's it. Right, that's all you've got to worry about. So then you ask the person, well, you know, the church is done saving you. Did you know that? And then you can say, the only thing that can save you is Jesus. And that's it. And that's where you end your conversation. Do you know that's how easy it is? I can see you looking at me and thinking, no way. Fire. All of you are now professional evangelists. All right? Put up your hand if you're professional evangelists. Nobody here. <laughs> yeah. By the time you finish this message, you'll be a professional. Because now you've got the tools. Is it difficult? Is it difficult to talk to a person like that family? No. Why were you so scared before? Because you didn't know. You didn't know where to start. People get so overwhelmed. They think, oh, I've got to know the Bible. There's 66 books. How do I know all the Bible? How do I know all the verses? What do you say? Don't worry about all that. If you read one verse a day, the Holy Spirit will give you enough information when you need it. Start with the basics. Family, interest. What church you from? And then you end very simply with Jesus. Is the only person that can save you. Is it simply like that? I think so. So after that, he got into the chariot, Philip got into the chariot, he was talking to the, the eunuch Ethiopian about the Bible, and you know what he was reading? Well, what book was he reading from? Isaiah. He was reading this verse, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened up his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is done. So he opened not his mouth. The question that the Ethiopian asked Philip was, who is this talking about? Who is this about? Is this about the writer, Isaiah, or is this about somebody else? Let me ask you that same question. Who is this verse about? Jesus. I think the picture gave it away. Or what? Or even looking at the picture. Oh, okay. Yeah, who is it talking about now? It's talking about Jesus. Yeah. And that's what I love about it, because it's that simple. He had to pick the one chapter in the Bible. They gave the clearest description of Jesus that we know. Your homework for this week is Isaiah. Has anybody read Isaiah 53 before? This is what you're going to do this week. You're going to read from verse 1 to the end, and you're going to come back and tell me that it's not about Jesus. The gospel that we preach is not about your church. Please don't tell people about St. Mark's Congregational Church. Please don't tell people about your great, wonderful minister, Raymond Butler. <laughs> Okay, he mentioned me a little bit. Now, he, he never mentioned my name in your witnessing. He never mentioned the church. Never mentioned God. I'm going to take congregation off that thing if you mention it to anybody. Don't mention St. Mark's. Why? Because the only focus is Jesus. Listen to what Philip said. Acts 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. And he preached to him St. Mark's congregational church. No, he preached Reverend Raymond Butler. I love titles. I love titles. Reverend Raymond, but no, he preached Jesus. And I told him before, you need to know the Bible when you're preaching. You need to know all the verses, do you? No. And we love me if I could tell you today that 
You have to learn like 20 to 50 different scriptures before you go witness to people. And that's not only the one scripture. One verse in the Bible that says it all. It says it all. And with that one verse, you can reach one person, two people, three people, five thousand people. Who knows this verse? I want to see your hand. Put it way up if you know this verse. Alright, so now you all are professional evangelists. Well done. You're ready to take your name by storm. I want people to come to me and say, what's happening? They say, Mark, the people are on fire for you. They, they're preaching up a storm. If they don't come back to you, they don't want to preach this again next week. You're right with that. Because maybe you missed something. Right? John 3.16, we know this verse. So if you really know it, we're going to speak it out into the prophetic word. Let's say it together. One, two, three. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have the last life. That's it. That's the gospel. We don't preach church or ministers or pubs or anything. We preach Jesus. God loves each one of you. Each one of us. He loves each one of the people out there, the beggars, the blacks, the whites, the pinks, the Somalis. You like Somalis? I love them because Jesus loves them. All those people out there, God loves me, loves so much that He said, Listen, I love you so much, and I know that there's no way you're going to get to me. Even you in this church. We think we're so all high and mighty, and oh, we dress so cool, and we got all the money, we got two cars, and all that. It's all rubbish when it comes to God, because we're all sinners. We're all at the bottom of the barrel, and God says, I love you. And because you cannot get to me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you my son, my only begotten son, and I'm going to give him. And I'm going to kill him. He's going to die. And on that cross, he's going to shed his blood. And why is he going to do it? Because I love you. That's the gospel of Jesus. Can it be more simpler than that? And when you preach to them that Jesus loves them so much, he died for them. They are then saved. Paul says in the Bible, that a, a jailer comes to him and says, How can I be saved, Paul? And he says, Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. He doesn't say anything else. There's no buts or causes or some causes. Nothing. He says, believe in Jesus. And you will be saved. This is the one verse you need when witnessing. And this is where you end it. If the person engages him and talks more and asks more questions, great. But this is where you end off. Because if you add anything to this, you'll get far beyond what God wants you to do. There is nothing but Jesus. I've heard this equation. I'm not very good at math, but this is my favorite equation ever. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. You get that? You say it again. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Because it is nothing. It's not Jesus in baptism. It's not Jesus in membership. It's not Jesus in church. It's not Jesus in tongues. It's Jesus. For we preach the cross of Christ. For to them that perish is foolishness. But for us who believe that it's the power of God, that's what the Bible says. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Let's go back to the jungles of Ecuador. <coughs> How many missionaries were there? Five. They all died. On the screen you see Jim Elliot's wife, the lady in the middle. Her name is Elizabeth. After they were killed, you know what she done? She went back to Ecuador. And she lived among the Hawarani tribe. There they are. We do need that. This is the same tribe that just killed her husband. Slaughtered them. Horrible. Savage. What do you see on her face? A smile. How can she be smiling? Would you be smiling? Or would you ask Donald Trump to send a little airplane over there and drop a little bomb? That's what we can do, right? She's smiling. She's jumping in the and just thought, you know what happened? She went back and she started to preach them the gospel. She started to help them, give them medication, give them help. And you know what happened? Many of the tribes members became Christians to her efforts. So did Jim Elliot die in vain? No, God had a plan for him. God sent Jim Elliot's wife back. And although he died, others came to Jesus. Wow, talk about a divine appointment. That's not all. The man in the middle is Steve Saint. Remember I told you about Nate Saint? Nate Saint was a missionary pilot. Steve was five years old when his father died. And you know what happened to him also? He
shake his hands. Because he understood this very, very beautiful, most powerful principle in the Bible. Each one of you can reach one person with the gospel of Jesus. If you're not doing that, you have failed as a Christian. Can I tell you that? Straight to your face. And as many other churches you can go to if you want to. I've kicked out of church before. One the first time. <laughs> There's four things that Christians should be doing. Four things. And I know you've probably got hundreds of things that you like to do as Christians. You read your Bible. Who reads their Bible yet? Second thing you must do is pray. Who prays to God yet? Only a couple of you. Counseling. Tuesday, Thursday. Third thing you do is gather together as Christians. You come to church. And that means gather anywhere with Christians, anywhere you want to. On the top of the mountains, in the valley, in this church, any other As long as you gather together as Christians, that's the third thing. You know what the fourth thing you should be doing? Is witnessing to people. The first thing we know when we've got Man, all of us do that. Well, we'll do that every day, Raymond. When I say witness it, whoa, whoa, whoa. Come on, do that. But do you know what's going to happen today when we leave this church? You're going to do that. Why? Not only is it a command of God, but I've told you how to do it. This is what the Bible says in Luke 14. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. That my house may be full. Isn't that beautiful? Let me tell you. Each one reach one. The battle we fight is not in this church. The body of Christ, the church of Christ, will never grow with you being in this church. The body of Christ will grow when you leave this church. And when you take this message and these practical applications and this instruction from God, even right now the Holy Spirit, I know He's talking to each one of you. And these people that you're going to meet today and tomorrow, uh, mark my word, it's going to happen. Right? And these people are going to come to you. And when it does, you better understand and remember this message. Because it's not going to be just some blase thing you come into. It's going to be a test. God is saying, do you have it? Can you reach out to just one person with the gospel of Jesus? Can you do that today? I believe and declare if you do this, you understand this message. And you just reach out to one person with the gospel of Jesus. Not only will this person come to the full knowledge of Jesus Christ and be saved, but you will become everything that God created you to be in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Let us sing our last song.